Live from the Moscone Convention Center in San Francisco, California, it's The Q at Oracle Open World 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor QLogic with support from HGST, Violin Memory, and Mark Logic. Now, here is your host, Dave Vellante. Welcome back to Oracle Open World, everybody. Yesterday, at the close of yesterday's segment, Jeff Kelly and I really spent a lot of time on, on big data and you know, sort of forecasting out what's going to happen in different scenarios of what's going to happen to the likes of, of Oracle and, and SAP and Teradata, because we clearly see that the traditional enterprise data warehouse is being disrupted you know, by Hadoop. Our practitioners in the Wikibon community have, have told us that and shared with us that they're rapidly moving resources sort of away from traditional EDW into Hadoop. At the same time, you see these large companies with so much cash, they can buy companies, they can make moves in the chessboard. Um, so, it's great to have uh, an individual here who was involved in the Hadoop movement from the very early days. Konstantin Kozbudnik is the Vice President of Open Source uh, Software Development at Wandisco, a good friend of theCUBE. Koz, welcome back, it's great to see you again. Uh, thank you, Dave, actually, it's great to be here again, and uh, you know, I love it, because you guys are awesome bunch, and I enjoy seeing how you're actually expanding and growing, and from a little sublet of the Fry's Warehouse back in Palo Alto four years ago, look at you now, I mean, well, it's, you know, it's incredible. Though, you know, and, and when John Furrier was in that warehouse, which was at the time, Cloudera's you know, headquarters, yeah. uh, you were there, and, and John said to me when I first met him, you know, we got to be all over this Hadoop thing, and I was like, Hadoop? I've heard of it, but I really don't know what it is. <laughs> and then, you know, he dragged me in. And, and thankfully, because people like you uh, see the future, because you've got you know, technical savvy, but you can understand customer requirements. So think about how far we've come from those early days. Like, the what is Hadoop? When, you know, how does it work to you know, it basically changing the world? So where are we with HDFS? And you know, what's the state of Hadoop these days? Um, I think actually, and, and again, thanks a lot for, for all the compliments about the, my visionary capabilities, which is not that, that much, because I joined Hadoop actually in essentially 2009, I guess, which was a couple of years underway already. There were people who believed in that much more than I did, so, and then if you think again about Cloudera, mm. like from four people in essentially like small room somewhere in the Berlin game, they grow up to the company of what, like almost 800 people now, right? So I mean, these, these are people who are moving the market or look at the Hortonworks and stuff. So, but anyway, so I was fortunate enough to be the part of it and I'm fortunate enough to uh, put, put some effort into HDFS particularly and uh, looks like it, it's actually taking off. So people actually get in, get in on board with that and they see the, the benefits of, of using HDFS and uh, we, I think I get into the point where locally deployed HDFS is no more a sexy thing, right? So like having a 10, 10 nodes cluster is sort of okay, but it's not, it's not what companies who are paying money for the, for the technology are really interested in. So essentially I think what we're going to see as a next step is Hadoop, we actually sort of see this already, but uh, more and more of it will come, where Hadoop and essentially the, the, particularly the storage um, uh, that founds the, the, the Hadoop ecosystem will be demanded much more in a high availability or continuous availability fashion. So essentially you will see more and more of it going in the global deployments cross data center boundaries and essentially you will have to be able to move the data back and forth freely without any, uh, b b b uh, any, any limitations, any delays if you will. So you should be able to utilize more than one data center in a better in a better fashion, because, like as 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 you know, the company I am working with, Vandisco, is in the business of providing you with 100% availability of distributed systems. So the way we do this, we essentially can guarantee strong, strong consistency on the data changes, and in case of the Hadoop, we can guarantee that your data center operation happens in the land speed although you can, cr can work across, uh, across the globe, right? Literally across the globe. So what we recently introduced in the latest version of our software is the concept of uh, HDFS zoning. So if you, if you kind of think about the, the concept of the zone, it, it's something that has the good level of isolation 
uh, within the global system and allows you to do something very specific for the zone inside of it without others coming and stealing the resources and stuff. So like typical Hadoop cluster is usually represented in the form of monolithical bunch of the nodes, right? So like, I don't know, 10,000 nodes, 1,000 nodes, and then you have a number of the applications deployed within these 10,000 nodes, like HBase and Impala and Spark and what's not. And then all they're trying actually to do something with the data that is store, stored in, in, the, in the storage. Well, <laughs> stored in the file system. So what you get out of it is essentially you get the competition over the resources. Because HDFS has this data locality uh, uh, property, which is great for the uh, linear scalability, you might get into the situation where you have the data in a certain node, however, none of the available containers in the node uh, can be provided to your particular application because it's taken by somebody else, so you get into the point of the contentions. And then you and get- And everything stops at that point. Precisely, yeah. you will have to wait, so you yeah. can, I mean, you'll have to have a scheduling mechanism to, to go around the starvation points and you know, fair schedule and that kind of stuff. The problem with the schedulers, especially with the centralized schedulers, is that they all have single point of failure to start with, and they're actually usually not that flexible. That's the problem. They, they cannot account for all the types of workload in the system. So for instance, HBase might need this type of the workload and Spark needs something different. Uh, if your cluster is managed by Yarn or something like that. Yeah, I was going to say, Yarn doesn't solve this problem, right? It, 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 it sort of gives you an ability to kind of have the queues and whatever, but it doesn't solve the problem completely. Mm. And I, 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 I hate to brag about this, but I know a little bit about the schedulers. I was do, doing monolithical schedulers for some microsystems. Please, ironically, please brag about it. I could say, <laughs> this guy knows what he's talking about. So, ironically, so, we, we at Oracle, right? So, and some microsystems right. actually, yeah, we, we did the cluster. It's not, it's not an easy problem. To, it's not an easy solve, problem, right? and it's not a new problem, essentially, right. right? So, people were trying to solve it for many years. So, or, uh, the Yarn is trying to do this for Hadoop. They do, actually, they, they have a great success in that. But it's still the same kind of chicken and egg problem. You have to deal with the resources that somebody else is requiring and you have to be flexible enough to actually prevent the starvations and, and be efficient enough. So what we do inside, and, and if you think about this, the whole, the whole attempt of scheduling of these resources, right, is essentially give you the CPU and memory to work with the data that already sits in the um, file system, okay? So what we do instead, we say like, forget about this whole scheduling part, right? So you have your, HDFS cluster, at any given point of time, you can actually bring a bunch of the nodes, right, add them to existing HDFS cluster as a separate zone with, with, with its own name nodes, its own high availability, and you can actually flexibly configure what part of the global common uh, HDFS namespace will be available in this zone. So for instance, imagine that you have HBase specific parts and bits of, of your HDFS cluster. So you bring, the HD, you, you bring up the HDFS uh, zone, uh, sorry, the, the HBase zone. You only schedule to replicate HBase specific data into this zone and then you start to use the HDFS uh, HBase cluster right. and you work on your cluster as much in, as long as you need to. Uh, nobody tries to steal your hardware. You can tightly control what data is available inside of HBase zone and what data can be migrated outside of the HBase zone, right? And uh, the best part is that once you don't need it, you can disassemble it, right, and, and go. And you can deploy a Spark cluster now. Or you can have a bunch of the different zones that have essentially heterogeneous characteristics. You can have machines with a huge memory where only in-memory analytics would be running and nobody else would be able to touch them. Right? Yet, you can actually flexibly reroute your data, data streams within the, this uh, zoning mechanism of HDFS. So now this is a capability on top of your existing platform? It's a feature? It's another product? It's essentially a continuation of what we do. Yeah. So, and uh, the best part is actually with the concept of the zones, we sort of remove the gap between like LAN and WAN uh, sides of the product, right? We used to have LAN clusters and WAN clusters. Now actually you can use van product within a single data center, but make your different parts of the HDFS cluster, right, the different zones, uh, behave like essentially uh, across the van, across the van uh, sides of the cluster, right? So like imagine you have, in case of BDA, right, so our, our uh, partner uh, Oracle BDA, they have these exadata racks 
each one is actually stuffed with the hard drives and, and, and processing power, and each one is actually by itself is uh, big data plans, right, running Cloud on it, uh, CDH on it. So what you can do, you can have every single rack to, to represent an HDFS zone, and every single rack can actually run its own workload, and it doesn't matter from our perspective if these racks are actually sitting within, you know, data center, or they actually span across the, across the globe. So it's still a zone of the same unique uh, HDFS file system. So what are you seeing in terms of Hadoop adoption inside of Oracle? Obviously we're here at Oracle <laughs> Open World. What, uh, you gave a talk today, I want to come back to that, but what are you seeing as far as interest in Hadoop? We actually, uh, again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in the sales. I only can guesstimate what we do there. <laughs> But, yeah, you don't uh, have to give me hard numbers, but you see, you see the landscape. Yeah, we actually, we actually see a huge, huge up, uptick in the, in the number, of, number of the customers who come into us and, and they want to start doing POCs and PLCs and, mm -hmm. and actually try the technology. So, and as you know, this, this is a little bit different market from your typical point-to-point -point software kind of sale, right? So it takes longer, I guess. It, it's more complex technology, more investment is involved, and it's actually not a week sales, it, it's three months, six months, whatever it is. But uh, again, not my cup of tea to, to, to judge. But uh, yeah, we see, we see quite a bit of actually big guys coming in and, and hopefully like Oracle BDA will actually help us as well to spread the technologies around. And your talk today, um, earlier, what were you talking about? Were you talking about HDFS? I was actually or? talking about, yeah, the, the multi-data multi -data center Hadoop deployment, essentially in a snap where it doesn't matter if you sit in across the van, if you sit in within the LAN, it literally doesn't matter because you actually have LAN performance on one side, van consistency, the 100% the consistency across the van. So you essentially you get yourself literally a global HDFS cluster. You don't need to synchronize the data at the logical level, you don't need to run DCP, you don't need to actually do huge, let's step back a little bit, right? IBM 360, right? Great concept, the only way to actually shut down the, the, the machine is probably like, brought the 12 gauge in a data center and shut it out of existence. Yeah, right? that and was the single point of failure. And right? probably yeah. even that won't yeah. work, right? <laughs> 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 but if you think about what Yarn is trying to do, right? So Yarn is saying, the whole Hadoop cluster should be a huge, big thing, and then we'll manage the resources inside of it, right? So what I like about different approach, like Mesos, for instance, is doing, right? So you have an amorphic set of the hardware, and then, depends on what kind of load you're trying to do in, the, in, in your cluster, you can actually bring up a bunch of small things and, and do your work and disassemble them. Um, I know that OpenStack sometimes is actually a not a good connotation, but think about OpenStack, right? So you have a bunch of the computational resources, you have a unified storage, and then you actually pop up your machines where you need them, mm -hmm. where the data is, and essentially doing something and disassembling something. Amazon Cloud, whatever. So we see the, the tendency of the uh, computing industry or the, the big data industry actually go to, to this cloud direction. What we give you, or what we give to our customers, is essentially a way to deploy HDFS into the cloud and be cloud file, file storage. Now, when you talk about cloud, you, you, you're talking about sort of public cloud, Private cloud, whatever cloud. Doesn't matter. Yeah, doesn't Literally matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> right. Because right. you guys, it doesn't matter. Yeah, we, we, yeah. We, do, we, do, we do global stuff, so it could be, could be public cloud. I mean, we, we do, for instance, on, on Amazon premises, we can spin up two different zones across the continent, and we don't see actually any performance degradations in terms of like workloads and all. So, I mean, it's literally a cloud file system. I've, I've actually seen that demo. Yeah, um, a few times, I guess. Brett, Brett is awesome, actually. Brett has come on the cube and. He, he came on theCUBE uh, in our offices in Marlboro and we ran that yeah. demo. Yeah. And, uh, so, th so that was Actually, to cool. give Brett, Brett, Brett a shout from here, I think he is the best live demo person I ever met. Yeah. <laughs> it's like flawless every time. <laughs> well, it, and unlike Bill Gates' demos, his work. Yeah. <laughs> Brett's work. <laughs> <laughs> or unlike the last uh, iPhone uh, yeah. uh, broadcast where yeah. the sound was choppy and stuff. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, Credit to you guys, actually. Sound so, was never choppy so, on you. <laughs> <laughs> Every now and then, but I think we're working on that. <laughs> We've done a good job this year. Yeah. Uh, no sound failures, knock wood. <laughs> uh, uh, talk a little bit about um, Ohm data, the acquisition oh. you guys made. Yeah, so Ohm data actually, um, as, as you know, we did the acquisition of this uh, company, private, private startup, 
uh, about two months ago. Mm -hmm. And essentially, uh, on data was working on the continuation of the HBase platform, where they would give you a better HA capabilities. They would give you actually multiple active region servers and that kind of stuff. So something that we were discussing back in February, essentially, um, when I last time was was with you guys talking about non-stop HBase and all. Yep. So. Own data was working in that direction, using slightly different technologies, but very similar set of you know goals and essentially very valuable set of skills for us. So we did this acquisition. We got uh, a few guys out of that, and essentially that helped us to boost our non-stoppage base um, line of product, which is hopefully going to be uh, rolled out into the into the market pretty soon. So I think. Another best part of, another good part actually of this acquisition is that we increase our footprint in, in the open source as well. So we actually were able to contribute a much bigger chunk of the code back into the open source community. So, because like, I don't believe in the closed source solutions. I've been doing open source for a long time. I don't think closed source is viable in the long term, right? Look at Microsoft, for crying out loud. Right, anyway, don't want to bash Microsoft. But what I think is that open source gives you common ground to innovate, right? Freely innovate, move faster, deliver better technology, essentially, to every one of us, right? So we st strongly believe in the multiple active masters systems, right? We strongly believe in a strong consistency in distributed systems. That's why we're actually trying to contribute this notion, this concept, this paradigm shift, if you want to, back in open source. And with different products, it's different. It, it goes with a different speed. So HBase, for instance, is much more receptive for that because HBase have seen so many problems with the scalability and the failover and right. attempts to fix it over the years. They're actually much more receptive to this whole approach. HDFS is a little bit more, I probably matured, so they, they kind of trying to take it actually cautiously, but we, we're sort of trying to bring this technology back into the open source, so hopefully, Hopefully, uh, in a very short term, we're going to have uh, active active capabilities implemented in the open source. In open source, ah. not not within the same level of the probably uh, bottle proofed coordination that we have uh, in our decon technology, but still, it would be it would be uh, working working well. Well, it's interesting your comments about open source. I mean, so the world is, I mean, everybody's using open source in some way, shape, or form, but the degree of contributions that they make to open source varies quite widely. Um, you have companies like IBM that have used open source as a strategic lever mm. and, and you know, put efforts in there. OpenStack has certainly brought people out of the woodwork. Uh, you've got people like VMware, sort of, you know, certain, uh, Maybe throw in a few bones to open source. I'm just going to say it. I'm sorry, Pat. Um, and and but so everybody sort of has their toe in the water. But in general, I would say the 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 market's quite bifurcated. Those who who really believe in it, it's it's a dogma. Right. And and, and those who really don't. <laughs> you know, Oracle would say, Oh yeah, we're open source. You know, we right. got open source. But 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 you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, so, do you see those two worlds? You know, coming together, are they at odds? Is it just sort of a natural progression of the industry? I mean, open source in your title. I mean, I know which side of the fence you sit on. Um, I think actually there are some collisions, of course. Uh, they're not necessarily explosive or harmful. I mean, essentially, all the companies we, we deal dealing with, we all here to make money. We, we need to be profitable, we need to survive, right? I mean, only some companies can get the, the money out of the Fed like that, right? So most of us cannot, yeah, right? Yeah. So we have to sell <laughs> products. So, and of course, that comes with a certain commercial interest that needs to be persuaded, and sometimes that needs to be reflected in the open source underlying the open source foundation. And of course, these interests sometimes do not well coexist with each other. So, however, open source is great because you always can find the consensus, and I'm using actual consensus explicitly because consensus is when you business, right? Yeah, so right. So we, we can always come, or most, most often, we can come actually to the consensus among the participants in the open source to find actually the middle ground that allows us actually to move forward and benefit each and every one of them, uh, of us actually, right? So I think open source is a great example of the evolution where things are happening sort of like 
chaotically, but it's it's very organized chaos, right? I mean, we open source is always moving forward, is always producing yet another better iteration of the software, if you look at it. And if something is not viable, it dies off. Well, it might be sad, it might be not so sad, but it's uh, probably the, the part of the normal evolutionary process. I mean, right. you look look around us. I mean, bad, bad ideas are kind of usually, usually <laughs> going away. Same in open source, the best idea wins, and uh, we, we're moving forward. And again, as you mentioned, OpenStack, you mentioned uh, Apache Software Foundation. I think it's very important to have software foundations to help people to come together and actually do something uh, on the common ground, right? And Apache Software Foundation proved to be probably one of the most successful in the sense uh, where it's commercially, commercially non-restrictive, everyone can, can come and contribute or benefit as much as they want to. Interestingly enough, you brought up the point about the, uh, VMware. I think actually VMware is trying to change the situation and EMC particularly trying to change the situation. If you look at the Pivotal, Pivotal has been created with the whole idea actually to yeah. boost the open Bob source Foundry. content. They have, I, I, meeting with Pivotal this morning, they got open source chops, no doubt about it. Right, and so, exactly. And, and so, and I think that will seep through. I think uh, VMware and EMC will learn from that, I, no doubt. I, I agree, and I was talking to, to a number of the people in, the, in uh, Pivotal back then when they were part of the EMC and stuff. Right. Or Greenplum, for instance. Uh, and they, they mentioned, again, I, I don't spill the beans, it's probably a well-known fact, they mentioned that it was very hard actually to get the open source contribution because every single patch had to be approved by a bunch of the corporate lawyers right. and validated against like gazillions of the patents that company holds. So what's I mean, the, what's the, and what's the ROI, and you got to go through that yeah, hurdle, and do, then, yeah, do then you, you get the patent trolls, right. right. So <laughs> it's, it's very hard. And with companies that actually devoted to, to open source, uh, again, don't want to bash about this, but uh, when DISC is one of them, we, be, we have a long story with Apache Software Foundation. No, we, we do believe in this in this philosophy. We actually contribute in pretty much all our work. Oh yeah, right. So, Kaz, what's what's next for you? What's next for WinDisco? What should we be watching? Um, I think actually I I found myself in a perfect position where I do what I want to and I get paid for it. <laughs> so I think this is <laughs> this is a dream dream job, in a sense, and uh, I. I am, the best part of this job is actually I am doing the engineering work all the time. So my, my fancy title helps me to, to deal and work on actually things that I like, although at the same time I actually doing my hand work, my leg work, my, my hands are usually elbow high in grease, you know. That yeah, yeah, stuff. yeah. <laughs> so uh, next one, I think we're actually going to double down on the, um, next features in um, HDFS. We're going to increase actually effort on the non-stop uh, non stoppage base, which is a big priority for us, I believe. And we see a lot of interest in there. So next, there are a couple of interesting cards up in our sleeves, so stay tuned. <laughs> well, you guys were early on, uh, everybody was talking about you know, making Hadoop Enterprise ready. You're t you've, you've started out targeting a piece of that problem and have been committed to that vision since day one. So. Uh, congratulations on getting to that point where you can do what you want and get paid, <laughs> and uh, working on that. I mean, I, I, I have no complaints. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, all right, Kaz, thanks again. I know you're super busy. Appreciate you stopping by the Cube. Thank you very much for feeding me into the schedule, guys. Uh, it's always fun to be here, and uh, yeah, next Excellent. time. I all guess. right, <laughs> keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest right after this. This is the Cube.